So good morning, I am Ty Cruz. I am the lead mentor for 7068. And uh, uh, co-hosting with me today is Jake Lynn. Want to introduce yourself? Yep, uh, hello everyone. My name is Jacob Lynn and I'm the captain of uh, Team 7068. We're from St. Francis, Minnesota. And we're gonna be presenting on the electrical system of the robot today. Okay, so here's the agenda here we got. We're gonna go through all the components on here and give you one tips, tips as we go, go here today. So, so if you have questions, we really wanna hear from you. you. So we want in the chat room, we wanna ask you, we'll have a couple questions as we go along here, but we're gonna go through uh, the components with the power distribution board, tell you about the pneumatic board, the voltage regulator, motor control, and we're gonna really show you in detail how to integrate this in your robot so you have a nice looking robot wire-wise, so it's easy to troubleshoot as well as maintain and find things and add things that you want to the robotic competition and evolves the stream. So in the chat window, here's what we like to do. We like to always ask, is this your first year in robotics or have you been in robotics before? Or is this your first time doing electrical or even an interest of electrical? So if you want to answer in the chat, we appreciate that. So you can look at it. First year in FRC, great. Second, so, so the second, second year, have you been in robotics? Uh, did you do electrical the first year? Fourth year, second year. So, so how many of you have actually done part of the electrical team in robotics? Any of you? Come on, don't get shy now. Second year electrical, all right. Okay, your interest in electrical, all right. Well, we got a treat for you. So keep going in there. We're gonna start off by giving you the big picture of everything on here. Here's an overview of the control system, all the components on there. So if you missed our session last time, we went through all each of these components and details on here. So up here you'll see we have the Romo Rio, the all these modulars here on here. So this is the big picture of that. And also, also if you want to look, look on the screen here, we will show you our our, our board, board here. You should be able to see the board on the table here. There we go. So if you look at the control board here, you can see one of our boards here that folds up to a cube on here. Let's go on, Jake, and let's explain in a little more detail what each component is and how we can wire this. All right. Let's start off with the power distribution panel. So what this does is it basically distributes power to everything on your electrical board. So um, on, on the board here, this is the PDP right here. Um, it's distributing power to, let's say, our motor controllers, which are located here and here. And uh, let's see, it also is where you would terminate your CAN for communications. Um, every single port on this PDP that you use has to have a circuit, or a circuit breaker or a fuse on it. And these, what you want to do is when you get these, you want to make sure you cut the uh, tabs a little bit shorter and so that they don't, uh, they don't like sit above the PDP. Otherwise, you know, you can get metal shavings in them and stuff like that. Um, when you actually put something in the power distribution panel, you want to make sure that you have a ferro connector on them like this. And to put this connector in the PDP, you put your screwdriver in the top port here, you pull up on it, you slide it in, and then you release it back down once you once it's in there. So you put it in and then release it, makes a nice tight connection just like that. Um, also on the PDP, uh, that's where you put your battery connectors. So um, right here, that's where you put them. Uh, the positive goes on this side negative goes on this side. And this is coming from the circuit breaker, the main switch to the robot. So you wanna put the, uh, on the main switch to the robot, you're gonna have your, your positive terminal coming in from the, from the breaker into the PDP, and then your negative is going right back out to the battery. Uh, one more thing about the PDP, there's, I guess there's some fuses that are supposed to go here and here, and then, 
Well, on down here, you'll see on the, on the screen there in the PowerPoint presentation, there's the 20 amp fuse that goes for the voltage regulator, the VRM and the PCM, which is the pneumatic control module. These are little automotive fuses. And a lot of times in competition, we see that these fuses don't get pressed in all the way. Once you get them in, they're really hard to get in because the knife is really tight on here. So you gotta make sure they're fully seated on here. So you really wanna push on them, get them down all set in there. And as we go through the manual from first, this is the only legal way to hook up your VRM and your robo reel. And it has to go off this tamp fuse for the robo reel. If you wire to anything else in the power distribution board, the, the inspectors will gig you and tell you you have to go rewire it. So pay attention on here. Uh, these are really well uh, documented how to put these together. All right, next let's talk about the pneumatics control module. So I'll move the board here so you guys can see it on the board itself. Uh, it's located right here. All right, it's located right here. Uh, the pneumatics control module is what you would use to control all of your pneumatics, uh, your pneumatics devices on a robot. So that you're gonna control your solenoids and you would use those solenoids to, you know, Maybe control a uh, maybe control a cylinder of some kind. So on it we have our voltage input here. Um, you can run you can run uh, the PD or the you can run this thing on 12 or 24 volts, and you have to be careful because if you're running it on 24 volts, you can only be using 24 volt solenoids. If you're using 12 volts, you need to make sure that all of your solenoids are 12 volt solenoids. Otherwise, you might be, you might break something. Um, also on here, you have your compressor output. So your compressor is going to be uh, wired from the, right here, and you would uh, locate that somewhere on the robot, but it's wired back to here. Uh, you need to have your pressure release on here too. Uh, so that's basically going to shut off the compressor once the pressure gets to whatever FRC says is, a pro is an appropriate pressure. I, I believe it's 120 PSI. Yep. Um, uh, your can is in is coming in right here. Make sure that the yellow and the green are put on their respective ports. Uh, that's so that you can communicate with this to control the solenoids, things like that. Uh, and then the rest of these ports are all for plugging in your uh, solenoids. So you need to make sure that the polarity is correct. So put the red wire on the red port, the black wire on the black port. You have a total of eight solenoids is what it looks like on there. So. You can have up to eight solenoids and they all have to be the same voltage. So what's important, Jake, about the Mac? Go back. Here's, oh, go back one second. Yep. What's important about this slide right here and the voltage between 12 volts and 24 volts? Yeah, so if you're running a, let's say you're running a 24 volts over to your over to your uh, PCM and you put a 12 volt solenoid on there and you try to run it, well, you have a lot of voltage there. You're gonna probably break your solenoid after a few runs. If, uh, if you're running 12 volts to your PCM and you put a 24 volt solenoid in there, it isn't gonna work. It's not gonna power up. So you need to make sure that you have the correct solenoid for, for, for what uh, your voltage is. So, so here put I this, am Put the solenoid in there and we can see that in the view there. If you look in the solenoid on there, it has a voltage on there. So we need to pay attention. We need to go through your inventories on your solenoids because there's not uncommon that we'll find this in our regional events once in a while that someone will be trying to use a 24 volt on a 12 volt system. It doesn't work. And so you come and get the CSA and you'll come and ask us why won't the solenoid fire? And the first question I ask is are you using 24 volts and are you using 24? You cannot mix and match 12 and 24 volts, can you, Jake? Nope, you cannot. You gotta go one way or the other. So that little dimper switch is very important on there that you use all 12 volts or use all 24 volts as your voltage for your coil voltage on your solenoids. Okay, next we have the VRM. What's the VRM? So the VRM, the voltage regulator module, uh, you would run your radio off of that. And the reason we do that is because this thing can, I believe it can kind of give you a little bit of power. So if your power goes down for a small amount of time, this VRM can kind of compensate for that and keep the radio powered for a, short, a very short amount of time while the, 
while the uh, rest of the system uh, loses power. So that's important because it's going to take a while for the radio to reset if it loses power. So the VRM will give you that little bit of power that you need in case the power goes down elsewhere. Right. So what does it really do? It consistently puts out the 12 volts. So as your robot's running, you run your drives really hard and you start losing voltage in your battery, it's going to maintain 12 volt output on there at every cost it can, right? Please note, do not hook fans or other lights to this device. Why is that, Jake? Well, because your radio is powered and your radio is the most important thing. So if you lose power to your radio, your robot's going to be down. You don't want to draw too much current. What's the other thing that's very important to look at when you look at the specs on that thing? So what I always tell you guys, look at the spec sheet, right? Mm -hmm. And why is that? Um. Pop quiz. <laughs> very important because if you read on the, the VRM, they only put certain voltage out. One's only... 500 millivolts of little, uh, amps, right? Yep. So if you're trying to plug in a one amp fa um, fan in there, what's going to happen? It's going to blow up your VRM. And you just lost $70. Yep. Okay. So very important. These VRMs and FRC controls is made just to power the radio. Just the radio. Yep. Because if you lose the radio, it takes over 60 seconds to reboot that radio and reconnect to the field. And that's a lot of driving time you just missed, right? Yep. Awesome. All right, let's move on to the next portion. All motor right. controllers. Yep. Next, we got the motor controllers. So these, these are going to uh, basically control your motors. So we got all different kinds. We got Talon, SRXs, Victor, SPXs. We got the old Talons. We got the Sparks. Uh, as far as what we have here on the table, this is a Talon SRX. It's it's probably like the most complex one. You can do the most with it. On the top here, you have a port where you can you can plug in an encoder. You can plug in other devices. So let's say you wanted to communicate to the thing and tell it to like shut off if you know an encoder reaches a certain count on an actuator or something like that. You would use this to do that. Um, as far as maybe if you just wanted to spin a flywheel or something, you would use these. These are called Victor SPXs. They're a little bit more. They're a little bit cheaper. They're a little bit uh, less complex. And uh, yeah, you, well, that's what those are for. Uh, on this robot, we actually wired them really close to the PDP so that we didn't have to, you know, we didn't have to run wires and these aren't going to be used for encoders. So you just wire them right next to the PDP. Whereas the Talon SRXs, these we actually wired right down by the motor so that we can use the encoders and stuff like that. So that's why this one isn't actually on the electrical panel. Why is that? Jake, why, why was the design choice to put this talon down by the drivetrain? What so, was the restricting factor? Um, the length of the uh, the length of the wire that plugs into the port. Um, and what, what port is that port. cable on there? Uh, it's a ribbon cable. that. Plugs ribbon cable. The you do not want to run ribbon cables all the way through your robot. For one, they got really tiny wires in there and it's easy to break them. In fact, at Worlds, we saw a team that did this and went back and forth and squeezed it like a sandwich, tie wrapped it to their frame, and guess what happened? It blew the talon out. Shorted it out because their data ports do not have any overload protection on them. None. So if you short them out, you're done. Yep. And that's $90 right there. I mean, like say cost, but now it's that plus the time to place it on the fly, right? Yep. So what is the design thing we changed this past year to help with that? We used what kind of encoder? Oh, we used the uh, magnetic encoders. Is that the yep, but they were off of what protocol? That's that's uh, I don't know. Can bus, oh, right? Can bus. They were can off encoders. the can bus, so then we could integrate our motors back into right to the PDB, so we don't have to run these long cables from the power distribution all the way down to the drivetrain. Right? We can just use the cable, the wires pre-molded into the the talon itself, the drive, right? Uh -huh. And we can just go right down to our motor. We don't have to mount the drive and the motor next to the device. We can only just run the wires, right? Yep. And we did that by using the CAN bus uh, encoders that CTRE cross the electronics surprise. All right, does anybody have any questions so far? Type them in the chat. Yes, right now we're just going through some of the components. And in the next section, we're going to be getting into the actual wiring of it. So we've got questions about this, let us know in the chat. Questions? 
you know everything. All right. So the recap on here on uh, some of that is the wires on these connections, there's different design considerations to use with them. So you have to take a look at which uh, type of drive you're going to use. If it's a Spark, if it's a Vex Pro, uh, Victor SPX, the Victor SPX, uh, the, just the Victor SP has got different ones because they can be CAN bus or they can be what? PWM. PWM, which stands for? Pulse width modulation. Excellent. So there is design consideration is where are you going to be routing these? So on your robot, there's a lot of consideration because a lot of times electrical is last because we have to do what? We have to get the mechanical, right? Oh, mechanical yeah, yeah, yeah. usually has slows the electrical down. That's the case here at Delta sometimes too. We have to figure out where we got room to route everything and where their arms are going to go or what their motors they got to use. And then we have to fit the electrical around it. Yep. Okay. No questions. We're going to go on. The radio. All right, so next we're gonna talk about the radio. So the radio is what's going to be, you know, it's gonna to connect to the field and it's gonna be receiving all the information from the FMS and it's gonna be mainly controlling your robot. So you want your radio to be located somewhere where it's not gonna be, you know, getting interfered with by other electronics. Like you don't want, you don't want it to get messed up. This is, this is the most important thing. You, you wanna make sure that you have a solid connection and you wanna make sure that it's not gonna get messed with. Um, yeah, let's see the next slide, powering it, uh, we use power over ethernet and we actually buy a different POE injector because the one that comes with the kit apart isn't very good. It's orange. You should just throw it away and buy a new one. Exactly. Yeah. Real cheap. Amazon has on the link is right there. Uh, the presentation will be up on the website there soon as well after all the presenters done. Yep. So make sure you're not using the orange one. Use use something else, anything yeah. else. And pay attention to the direction on the POEs because there'll be an arrow and you want to get the Ethernet correct the way you plug them in um, because the only one that needs to feed the power will be the, the radio, not your robo reel. So pay attention on the, the direction of when you plug these in and what's sourcing the power. And where should that be wired again? That should be wired to the VRM. That is correct. All right, next we're going to talk about the robo reel. So this is basically like brains of your robot. It's going to store all the code. It's going to, it's going to be where the can is st starts. Um, I don't think I'm going to be able to get it on the camera very good because it's upside down. But on the presentation, it's right side up. So you just have to look at that. Um, on the top, we have the USB device, the input power. So you've got, you've got your 12 volt power coming in. Your uh, USB, that's that's what you would use in the, to program it or if you're running it at competition. Once you get your radio program to work with the field, you have to run it tethered with the USB port. Uh, next to that, we have the USB host. That's for plugging in cameras. So you have two USB ports, you can have two cameras. So you can run like a little USB camera, maybe if you want to have one on your actuator or and one on your drive train. It makes it nice when you're on the opposite end of the field and then you can see a little bit better with the camera. Uh, next to that, we have the Ethernet port, and we have the SPI. Todd, what does the SPI do? It's not a communication protocol. It's a serial protocol mm -hmm. or an interface. So it's all serial. It's kind of similar to the RS-232 port. All right. Uh, next, on the far right, we have the PWM control. PWM stands for pulse width modulation, and on the PWM, you would be running things like... Uh, Maybe you would run a spark motor controller. So those are a little bit, they're a little bit different. They're not going to be running off your CAN system. You're going to have to communicate with them with the PWM instead. And it's got like a three wire uh, system. You're going to have a red wire, a, a black wire, and a white wire. And that's that's where you plug that in. Um, let's see. You have the reset and user buttons on there. So if you reset it, it's, you hit that. Uh, analog inputs. You, I believe that's eight bit analog. Yes. Yep. 8 bit analog uh, relay controls for relays. Uh, your robot signal light, that's where you're going to plug in the little orange light that looks like this. It's uh, this is what's going to tell you if your robot's enabled or not. So if it's disabled, it's going to be just a solid orange. If it's enabled, it's going to be blinking, letting you know to stay, you know, to be cautious around the robot. So that's where you plug that in. 
Uh, next to that on the left, we have the direct or the DIO, the direct input output. So that's going to be like your on off. That's that's you'd plug limit switches into that, I believe. Uh, custom electronics port. So you plug in your custom electronics. Maybe if you want to have like a Raspberry Pi or an Arduino or something like that on your robot, that's where that is going to get plugged in. Uh, there's IS or I squared C communication. I believe that's kind of an Arduino thing. You have your protocol for communications. Yep. And then your can is next to that. So that's where you're going to run those uh, yellow and green wires. That the next slide here. Yeah. Uh, the Robo Rio uses NI real time Linux. Uh, it's got three mounting features. So you can zip tie it, or you can use 440 screws on the back, which is what we did. So we have the basically like a mounting plate with some standoffs and then some 440 screws holding it on. Uh, next, we have the CAN connection. So your CAN connection is your main communication line. Uh, it's, it's the yellow and green wires. It starts on the... Uh, the robo reel and you run it to all your devices and then it ends at the pdp so make sure that you don't plug them in backwards everything's everything's plugged in correctly uh throughout the robot you'll have these connectors with with the uh that that run your can that you plug your can wires into this is to extend your can wires so if you're connecting devices you're going to connect them with these connectors we like to put ferrules on them which so that they're when they go in here, it makes a nice connection. So that's how that works. They just go in there like that and clip them shut. Okay, next we have the RSL. Uh, like I said before, this is basically used for uh, telling you if your robot's enabled or not. An important thing to remember is you need to make sure that the LA and LB wires are connected. Otherwise, it's not gonna work. So you gotta make sure that those are connected. Won't flash. Yeah, will not fire. flash. All right. Next, we have the battery and circuit breaker. So the circuit breaker is what you're going to use to turn your robot on and off. So I'll see if I can get it under the camera here. All right. This is what the circuit breaker looks like, if you can see on the overhead cam here. To turn the robot on, there's a little lever here. You just push that in like that. And then to turn it off, you push the red button and it opens the circuit. And an important thing to remember is that uh, you need to run the positive terminal of the battery into the, into the circuit breaker, not the negative terminal. So you need to have your positive wire connected to the, to the uh, circuit breaker. All right, next we have the battery. Um, this is obviously the main power of your robot. This is powering it. Uh, you need to make sure when you get it, you're not going to have the 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 connection, the little connector on it. You need to put it on. And when you put it on, make sure that these terminals are nice and covered up so that they're not, you know, you don't get metal shavings in there. It's just, it's just nice and safe. You don't want to make it a mess. And like the middle picture on there, it's just a mess. You don't want to do that. Right. So just to comment on that, Jake, as I do control work around the regionals, we see a lot of these are loose. So if you have a robot that fails on the field and I get called over to your pit, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab on and I'm gonna try and wiggle these cables. If I find a loose cable, we're gonna say, that's probably the issue. So, and then another thing to consider when you're mounting these batteries and stuff like that is the orientation of that. So a lot of times we will redo these every year, right, Jake? Yep. You know why? Well, you don't, they get loose over time. They start to deteriorate. And we don't know which direction the mechanical are going to give us to which way we're going to mount the battery, right? Because you can move these batteries horizontal or you can bring them right up vertically like this. And it all depends on your robot design. So just keep that in mind. And then we will. We want to redo them and put some shrink tube on here and use the colors on here. You can buy some red and uh, black shrink tube as well. We've been on here, but solid. On the right there, you'll see on the power presentation, you'll see nice 3D printed uh, parts. And the link is down below on there, but you can just Google it. There's a lot of nice, cool 3D printing ones. But again, you might not want that orientation. So then your wires will come up straight up and bend, which can cause issues as well. Does anybody have any questions so far? There's a question here. 
It says, uh, if you have a CAN bus, why might you want to use a PWM to control a motor? Great question. So it's really personal preference, in my opinion. Um, and design consideration of where you're gonna mount everything. So if that controller is right there, you can uh, keep it close enough to the rubber reel, right? And you can run that PWM cable right to it. Now, that's one consideration design thing. Number two is what are you gonna use that motor for? Am I wanna do, do I wanna do some type of encoders feedback, some profile moves with it, or I wanna get high speed and move it to an arm really quickly. That you can't do with most PWMs. You can, but here's the consideration. It will not be through the drive. So let's say you're moving along and you're trying to move an arm to a particular quick to a position. Well, and you don't care when it gets there. Do not use PWM. Why do I say that? Because the where all the commands are being crunched down and being used at is the robo reel. It's not being done real time on the drive. So if I want to do high speed and I want to do something accurately, I'm going to do my computation on the drive, right? Yep. It's not easier because that drives monitoring that encoder at that time instead of feeding it back to the main FPGA board, which is the rubber reel, and then back to the drive, okay? So there's really no right or wrong reasons. If we're just doing a quick intake and we're just intaking a ball and it's just pulling the motor, PWM all day long. If I can take and design consideration and put it on the board. And so the one thing that's unique about 7068, the way we build our boards is, you see our boards right here on the table. We always build removable table, uh, removable electrical boards. And what's the main reason we do that, Nick, or Jake? Well, the main reason, we, well, there's two main reasons that I can come up with. The first is that if you're gonna be drilling on your robot, you wanna be able to take your electrical board off so you don't get metal shavings in there. And then the second is it's just easier to be able to work on it off the table rather than having it on the roll or off the robot rather than having it on there. So those are kind of the two main reasons that I can think of why we would do that. Exactly that. And then it gives our programmers a chance to pre-program everything, get everything run, everything addressed and everything yep. tested. Because we can also plug in motors and spin a motor on a table. Yep. We don't need the robot to do that. Electrical people can get all wired. The programmers can go and hide in their little room and we can be mad scientists and start spinning motors and doing stuff without the robot being actually finished. So that's the design consideration. Uh, do you need to need a cool and what does that say? Cool any of the oh, cool cool electronic, electronic products? Okay. So uh, you might have seen on our board, we are our electrical guy that built this in 2019. Was this our 19? Yeah, board? No, this is our yeah, 18 board. One of the boards. Yep. yep. He put a fan on here. You do not. Most of these components, they get they get warm, um, like the drives, motors, and stuff. But it's not required on there. Sometimes we put fans on our way run in the summertime at county fairs and stuff like that, or just run them on pavement and stuff it will get a little warmer because it's hot outside, but not needed for the competition. Great questions. Is there any other questions? We'll move on. All right, let's move on. All right, we got another question for you. We're gonna, we're, this is gonna be the start of the demo section where we're gonna show you how to crimp wires and strip wires. So who has stripped wires before or crimp connectors? Great, got one says both, yep. Okay, so it sounds like some of you have done it. Okay, so how many of you that just said we have done it feel very confident that you can do a splice or a crimp on with a ferro? Excellent. Meaning, if I did a tug pull test on your boards, uh, the wires wouldn't fall out. Who's confident of that? <laughs> all right all right, check, so. go ahead all right uh wire placement uh you want to make sure your wires are organized uh, as you can see on the picture of the left i don't know that looks more like a scrap bin but it's just kind of like a you know don't do that uh, this is how you're going to want to do it look on the overhead camera everything is placed like every component that's connected is kind of placed near where 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 it's going to be connected to so like the motor controllers you know we place the motor controllers right next to the pdp so that we can fold it up nice you know 
So everything is just right next to it, and there's no there's no funny wires that are you know going all over. This can the can wire used to be a little bit more tucked in, but you know the board's kind of falling apart. That's okay. It's still pretty organized. You can still tell what's going on. It's not a mess. It's easier to work on it. It's nice and compact. So make sure that when you're when you're placing your wires, just in placing your components, just you know account for account for where where everything's gonna you know what's connected, what's you know just have everything close together. Uh, okay, we have some electrical tools, so I'll probably start demoing those. Uh, on the screen now, you can see a few examples. Uh, on the top there, we have a couple different crimping tools. Uh, the one, on, the one on the right there, that's the or that's uh, Anderson pole crimper. So that's what you're going to use for the power pole connectors, which I'll show you in a little bit. Uh, we have a couple examples of some wire strippers there, and then another type of crimper. But we'll, we'll get to those. Uh, let's see, uh, wire cutting. Uh, try to keep the wires at a decent length, you know, so if you want to reuse a component or if you want to make adjustments later, you, you don't want to have short wires. That just kind of becomes an issue. So make sure that when you do cut wire, leave yourself a little wiggle room because you never know you might have an issue and you need to go back and fix it. So leave some, leave, leave like six inches of wire. Uh, let's see, uh, solder, needed connectors, and power poles for your wires. So if, let's say you're running something from the PDP. Uh, you're going to want to, and let's say you have like a, let's say you have a motor controller that's down by, down by a motor somewhere else that's not on your electrical board. You're going to want to run, you're going to want to have power pole connectors, which I'll show in a little bit, but they plug, they plug into each other and they, they're just super nice if you need to take something apart. Uh, you could do that. Uh, Let's see what else we got. Uh, this is uh, these are on the like the connectors on the boards. Like for example, here on the on the uh, PDP, we have this type of connector. You want to make sure that you put a ferrule on those and that you plug them in, uh, plug them in correctly. On the picture on the left there, the wires are not all the way down in there, and that could be hazardous because you get metal shavings in there and short something out or they could break off and then you have an issue. So you wanna make sure that you have like on the picture on the right where the wires are nice and set deep down inside of the connection. Right, and what we really prefer is to have ferrules on there. So if you see that picture on the left there, it can short out real easy. And if I probably tugged on it a little bit, it more than likely would pull right out yep. because we can tell the wire's not all in there and there. So if you do a ferro connection, a square one that we're going to show you in a minute, the square type ferro, you don't even have to push the spring down. You can punch them right in. And then we're going to show you that in a minute. Yep. All right. We'll just, we'll show you guys how to do ferro connections and how those all work. So we're going to start with. All right. So to do a ferro connection, I think you guys, hopefully you guys can see this. You want to take and you want to strip your wire. You want to figure out where, and you want to strip it, you know, at a decent length. I'd say probably a good half inch or so. And then what you do is you twist it up a little bit, twist up the wire just a little bit like that. And then you take the ferrule, and this is this is what a ferrule looks like. Oops, that's what a ferrule looks like. You take it and you slide it on the wire like that. Make sure that the plastic part is is over the wire. You don't have any metal showing. And then what you do is you take the ferro crimper. You and get a wire showing outside there. And then you put it in. It's and don't put, don't put the plastic in there. Just put the just put the metal the metal end in there. And then you clamp down on it. It'll automatically release. There you go. You got a ferro. So show the end there. And tip it up. Okay, so if you get it over a little bit, so you can see the inside there. So one thing I like to recommend is the, that the wires come all the way through. So if you look at the top here, it's a little bit, as you can see a hole there. There's a, there's a picture on the next side. Yeah, I like the wires to come all the way through. So strip it back enough where the wires can actually go through all the way to ferro. And when you crimp it down, then you'll trim that off a little bit. And if we go to the next slide, I think we have a picture of it. Uh, it's one of the next ones. Uh, this is just kind of the example of. We'll go back one slide. I think it's in the. 
Oh, see there. right there. See the bottom there where the wires, all the little wires go right through the, to the end of the ferro crimp, right? Yep. So then I know I have it crimped and I can do a pull test on there and I just not gonna pull out. If you don't strip the wire back enough, what can happen? Well, it could slip out and then you've lost connection. Right, or if you're stripping the wire and you start breaking some of those strands out there, what is that gonna do? Well, then you're gonna, well, you're gonna have uh, higher resistance because you don't have as many strands of wire. Correct. So the, what's very important on these ferrule connections, one say, I'm using ferrules, but then if you really look at it, they're not being crimped all the way through or you're losing enough, too many strands to get a good connection on there. Because a loose connection is gonna do nothing but cause you random issues on the field. Yep. All right, next I'll show you how to put them on. So for example, let's just, we're just gonna use the PDP kind of as the example. So what you do, is you just take them and you just slide them in a hole like, just like that. Make sure that it goes all the way in. If it doesn't go all the way in, you might have to trim the end just a little bit. But So make sure that there's no metal showing like that. And then do a pull test to make sure you can't pull it out. See, it's nice and tight in there. You're not gonna be able to get it out. It's a nice secure connection. And then take it out. If you ever did need to take it out, you take a screwdriver, push down on the little white part like that, and it should just pull out like that. So that's how you, that's how you use them. I don't have one of these. Well, we have the, we have we have the, the tool for this. So in the chat window, tell me what these colors represent on there. Show them the other one right there. Oh, yeah. So on the screen, it's, uh, it's got green, or it's got, excuse me, yellow, blue, and red. In the chat, tell me what that means. Anyone know? Okay, we're getting some answers of thickness of the wire, different gauges. Okay, so that is color coded for size of the, the size of the connector, which is your correct is part of the wire gauge, right? Yep. So it's very important if you're using that gauge wire for the blue, you're not putting in the yellow at the larger gauge size and trying to crimp something. So you always want to look at your gauge or wire, match the connector, match on here. They're color coded for a reason. Yep. Okay. We try and make it easy for you. So on here, also on the diagram shows you the proper way to crimp it, right? So if you crimp it the other way, what could happen? Then it, it doesn't push down enough, right? And make a good clamp on here. So the ears are designed to come down and crimp the wire, bring it tight down to the thing. And the key is here, not direct insulation. Now, we've done this in past turn, um, um, times. We would crimp it down, peel the insulation off, solder it, shrink tube it. Now, do you have to go that integrity? No. But if you really want a robust robot, make sure you crimp connectors. But if you doubt yourself, you can do that. You can solder it, shrink tube over it, and then put it on your robot and use it on your motor controllers. All right, next we're gonna talk about the Anderson power pole connectors. So these are nice for if you're gonna run a, maybe a motor controller off of somewhere and you want to, you're gonna have to run a long wire out to it. And uh, it, it also makes it nice. So if you wanna reuse motor controllers, you don't have to keep cutting and putting different connectors on there. You can use them year to year. It's really nice. Um, I have an example here of what that would look like. So when you get the Anderson power pole connectors, you have to crimp these these uh, metal plates on the end of it. And I, they're already pre-done, so I can't show you how to do it, but this is what they look like. And then this is the tool that you use. Again, it's the one with that's color coded like that. The yellow or the orange one. Oh, the orange one? Yeah, yeah. we use the orange one instead. Yeah. Oh, it looks like this. Uh, to actually do it, you would, you would put it on the wire and then you would stick it in like this and then you would clamp down all the way through and then it will automatically release when it's done. Like that, and then you pull it up and it comes out. So that's how you do that. And then to actually put it on the connector, this is the plastic part that, that actually is the, the connector. So inside of here, there's a, little, there's a little plastic wall inside of there. And on the bottom of this, there's a hump right, right here. The hump has to go over that wall so you have to make sure that it's going the right direction. You stick it in there. And, and sometimes these motor controllers, the, the casing on the, there is a little bit flimsy, so it's difficult to click it in there. But you push it in there until it clicks in there. 
and then you should see on the end that the little hook is over the metal plate that's inside of there. So that's how you do that. Again, very important note here that you get that crimped all the way down in there and you hear snap. So when you push them together, if you do not, what could happen? Well, it could pull out. It's not going to even, it's actually won't even work. More importantly, it's going to vibrate and what could happen? It could fall apart. It could melt down. It could melt down. Start on fire. We've seen a, uh, one of the competitions where they got so hot and they were vibrating not tight, it actually melted the connectors down. We had to cut them all off on a, a rookie team several years ago. So let's continue on here, Jake, as we're getting closer to the end of the time. All right, uh, next we're gonna talk about soldering techniques. So uh, let's see, so when, you, when you're soldering, the first thing you're gonna wanna do is you're gonna wanna tin the tip. Uh, you oftentimes you can have like a, a wet sponge or sometimes they have like the, like a flux coated uh, metal shaving kind of a thing. Uh, what you want to do is I actually, I don't have power here, but I'll still just kind of try to show you what you would do to tin the tip. So what you do is you'd want to take your solder and you'd want to melt some on the tip and then you want to wipe it off on a uh, wet sponge or some kind of uh, like a, a brass, a brass uh, flux coated, uh, tip cleaning kind of a thing and then it, and what, what tinning the tip does is it makes it so that the, you, the solder can flow easier onto onto your wires and just it just makes it a lot easier to, to do the soldering uh, next is uh, heat shrink so heat shrink is kind of an alternative to using uh, electrical tape it's your rubber tube and you would slide it over your connection and then you use a heat gun and when you apply heat to the shrink tube, it'll shrink over the connection. Uh, uh, labeling, so you can, for labeling wires, you can use vinyl tape and color code your wires. Uh, you wanna use the same, you wanna use the same color wires for the CAN bus. So you always wanna make sure that you're, you're using the green and yellow wires and you're not using like red and black wires because you could get those two things mixed up and then you're gonna end up with problems because you might be using power wires where your signal is and then you're gonna, you know, you're gonna burn something out. Uh, wire labeling, there's many different ways to do this. Uh, in the middle, you can see there's like a zip tie, kind of a tag. What we like to do is we like to use a label maker and make our make a, like a kind of like a sticker to wrap around our wires. So you can see here we have we, get, we label all of our wires with these stickers on them and we can, we can label all our motors and we can label all our can so we know where everything's going and it saves us like let's say we have an issue right if everything's labeled correctly, we don't have to sit there with a multimeter and try to probe our wires to find the problem. You could just look at, you know, here's what's not working and then find the wires with those corresponding labels and then figure out where your problem is. So you only have to probe one part of the circuit and not the whole thing. Right. Very key. It doesn't matter what method you want to use, please use something. So if I'm doing control system advisory for that event and you have an issue, I'm going to ask for the electrical guy or the program it depends what the issue is. And I'm gonna ask you where that goes. And there's nothing worse than sitting there trying to trace something down instead of going and say, hey. And I like the students to make their own logical print, right? Mm -hmm. I want to have the schematic doubt because that's what we do in industry. That's how we do things here at Delta or else we'll never find something. These machines get large in a lot of multiple places. This is one electrical board with motors on here at the size of everything we do here. So. Do something, please. We urge you to do something. Doesn't matter what method is, as long as you can understand and explain it to someone else if you're having issues on the field. Uh, make sure that you're following the rules like uh, budget constraints, uh, motors and actuators. Make sure you're using FRC legal motors. Don't be using something that's not legal. You can, you can find that in the game manual. Uh, Make sure you're using legal power distribution, legal control and command signals. So make sure you're using PWM, CAN, I squared C, stuff that's FRC legal. Yep. Bottom line, use what's in the manual. Yep. All right, uh, up here we have our website, our Facebook page, and our email. Yep. So if there's any questions, if there's anything else someone needs and wants to know, or we didn't cover quite enough information on it, we got a couple minutes left here. This time is designed to ask questions. 
We can show you something in a little more detail if you like, or just general questions about the electrical overall. Um, you can also, uh, Jake, if you want to point this out, since we use a removable board, we use these uh, what's called terminal blocks with connectors on there that we can plug it in and bring it out to our motors. Yeah, yeah, these are these are super nice. These are called terminal blocks, and what they do is you can you can plug you can plug your wires in them, and they clip together. So let's say you have like a motor, a bunch of motors that are all kind of in the same area. You could just have a big terminal block that consists of all those motors, and you just plug them into the side like that. And it's also nice when you're when you when you want when you want to take the electrical board off, you just unplug it, and there you go. And then you're disconnected from your electrical system, and then you can take your board off. Okay, there's a question in the chat as, uh, what can you use to make your electrical diagrams? Now, first doesn't really point thing out for that. There's a lot of different CAD packages you can use. I mean, I've, I've seen people just use the uh, basic stuff for print or uh, for 3D printing. What's that one, SketchUp? Yep. You can, SketchUp is a great program, uh, easy, basic level to get started. Um, using components like that, and you can import a bunch of stuff, right? You can do different components and all that. AutoCAD works. Uh, first puts out SolidWorks. There is some uh, tools in SolidWorks, but it's really made for 3D modeling and your stuff of your robot, but you can use it. I, I'm just happy if the student just draws it on paper, honestly. I'm old school. Draw on a piece of paper first, but it's nice to capture it and put it in your engineering book to have at the competitions. Great question. Any other questions? Uh, what should, shouldn't you run rib, uh, ribbon cables over long distance? Okay, ribbon cables are, are never designed to run long distance because of the noise really. And it's got really fine letter, uh, wire gauge in there. So let me go this view. The wire gauge is so thin on there and if you weave it back and forth, um, it can easily break and, and you won't be able to make your connections. So on these talons, um, you, they come with a six inch uh, cable length as their preset um, default when you purchase it. They also have 12 inch ones. Now, uh, some of you are smart enough to go to DigiKey and say, I'll just buy the ribbon cable and put my own connector on because what first puts on there and tells you what the connector, the, the three and molded connector is to make your own cable. We suggest not doing it. Typically in industry like that we do here at Delta, we don't like ribbon cables at all. They're not robust. <laughs> they just don't hold up. So we like to use a regular jacketed cable with shields in them, even shield individual paired shielding for communication. Since it's communications with the encoders and that, you really want a robust cable, not the ribbon cable. But on your three D printing world, you guys use them all the time. Oh yeah, three you know, D printer. Well, I guess my three D printer does use like the just uses like a bunch of wires that are somehow they like glued together, and that's not really a ribbon. It's more of like a bunch of regular wires that are just kind of connected together somehow. Yeah. And especially if you're moving things around, if you get on your robots, any arm that moves or manipulator that's moving air cylinder or whatnot, you'll want to put some type of spiral wrap, split loom, and I usually bring an example of that and I don't have it. Um, the spiral wrap just wraps over it and makes it a little more rigidity off from it. And split loom's a little plastic, it's got, as it says, it's got a split on the seam. You can put the wires over it to protect it. Yeah, well, it helps. And, and also another thing about that is when you put the when you put the spiral wrap or the split loom on there, it makes it so you can use a P clamp on your robot, which is basically just like a little clamp that is made so you could slide the you could slide all those wires in there, and they're all like put together inside of the inside of the spiral wrap, and then it makes it easier to run them around your robot with those P clamps. So you can just slide them in there, and you can it's easier to maneuver those wires. Any final questions or anything? Matea, how are we doing on time? We are right at time, so we can wrap up. Huh? There are no more questions. Oops, I could do this. Very well. Well, thanks for joining our presentation this morning. Jake, you did an awesome job today presenting there. Any other questions? 
Um, we're also set this up. Uh, we're hoping to get some information posted on our, our Jumpstart Robox website as well. Um, join us uh, in December. We're looking at doing nomadic class as well.